My next guest needs no introduction. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, the senator from New York, has been one of the strongest allies of the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus con, uh, community in Congress. A decade ago, she led the fight to successfully repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I was there. I know she did it. A policy that banned gays from serving openly in the military. Senator, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a big day. This is our third hour of programming, which is sort of, you're not supposed to do that, you know, in the time of Zoom and online stuff. We've taken a few breaks. But what a fascinating journey we've had where, on one hand, we've talked about the Supreme Court decision uh, and the importance of that, but we've also talked a lot about the fragility of rights. And you're up there. You have been a leader in this. Are we in a fragile moment? We are in a moment where uh, advocates and protesters are setting an agenda, and Congress should be listening. Uh, members of Congress should be hearing exactly what our constituents are saying about Black Lives Matter, about dealing and addressing institutional racism and systemic racism. We should be addressing issues of LGBTQ discrimination. And I'm grateful that the Supreme Court did make this most recent ruling saying that the LGBTQ community could not be discriminated against in employment in the workplace. And so I'm hopeful that my colleagues in the Senate understand that that should also apply to the U.S. military, because we're about to start our debate on the National Defense Authorization Bill. And as you mentioned, this is an area I've been fighting for for a long time, uh, repealing the most discriminatory uh, LGBT policy you can imagine, which was don't ask, don't tell, telling men and women who are willing to die for this country that their service was not needed because of who they loved. And so this has been a long progression of trying to secure rights for our LGBTQ community. And now we need to secure them for our transgender brothers and sisters. And so I'm very committed and I'm hoping that members of Congress are paying attention to this moment that we, were, we are in to make the changes that people are demanding rightfully uh, with conviction and not stand by and do nothing. Why is it so hard? I remember speaking to Senator John McCain, the late John McCain, about transgendered service in the military. And yeah. he defended, he says, people who want to serve this nation. I mean, John McCain was adamant that we should not uh, put barriers in the way of people serving their nation, transgendered or any other stripe. I remember he was not with you when it came to don't ask, don't tell repeal. But when it was repealed, he says it's the law of the land and we're going to stick with. Why is that John McCain principle so absent at the moment? You know, John was a maverick and he liked being a maverick. He liked being at the forefront of some issues. And so when he came along from being against don't ask, don't tell to be for transgender, uh, support. It was great. It was a great moment of an individual understanding how important our service members are and that their uh, gender identity and who they love is not relevant to whether they can serve well. In fact, uh, it will only enhance their abilities. And so what we finally got to before he passed was a bipartisan amendment that Susan Collins helped with as well uh, to allow transgender service members to get the health care they need and to serve openly. And so now we're trying to reintroduce that very same bill. And I've asked for bipartisan support. Susan Collins is helping again, as is Jack Reed. And hopefully uh, we will get the number of votes we will need to pass this. Now, you've been a supporter, as I understand, of the Equality Act. And I want to ask about the Equality Act, but I also want to ask about how you achieve uh, results in, in these times, because you, you were the leader on Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, repeal, and you won, uh, and you got an administration. And, and you know, I reminded people, I had Raj, Rajiv Shah, you know, who used to head USAID on earlier, and you know, he was the first agency director during the Obama administration who just independently said, we're not gonna discriminate against LG, LGBTQ plus people, and truth be told, he was ahead of his administration. He got in a little bit of trouble for that because he was, he was ahead of the administration, which people may not recall and remember that. But how do you maneuver the pieces of the chessboard right so that it's not just an emotional moment, but it's actually a win? Right, so what we did in the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell is we lifted up the voices of service members who were already making these sacrifices so that we could acquaint other colleagues in the Senate 
who these people were talking about. These are men and women who will die for this country, will sacrifice everything for this country, and had been doing it so effectively. And so they began to realize that this policy resulted in the loss of 10% of our foreign language speakers, more than 1,000 in mission critical areas, it was harming our military readiness. And so they were open to, these, to this information that they didn't perhaps have. Um, same is going to be true with this transgender debate and with the Equality Act. I think the more we tell the stories of LGBTQ Americans who are suffering because they're being discriminated against in housing or in employment or because they want to adopt a child and they're not allowed to adopt a child because adoptions are run by religious organizations that prohibit it, it's not right. And so we just need to continue to tell the stories of those who are suffering so our colleagues can have maybe an ounce of empathy and decide it's the right thing to do to support LGBTQ Americans. Let me ask you a two-part question. Do you have A, allies in the Pentagon on transgendered service uh, in, in important places? And two, do you have allies that are, that are political in the Trump administration? Well, interestingly, uh, I, during hearings, asked every service chief uh, the head of each of the four services, whether they had any example of a transgender service member harming good order and discipline or um, the ability to complete a mission, any undermining of command, control, and good order and discipline. And to the T, each one said no, they knew of no example. So we've taken that testimony, we're trying to bring it far and wide. But for those service members to, I mean, for those, um, uh, service chiefs to say that in, in a hearing means they were not against uh, allowing service members to serve. And so I am optimistic that we do have allies within the Pentagon and that uh, we can get this bill done. Um, I don't know if I have any allies in the administration, uh, but hopefully they exist. Um, transgender LGBT people are in every community and in every job. So hopefully we do have allies there, whether the president knows it or not. One of the questions I've asked a number of people in this moment, particularly as the Black Lives Matter protests were coming on and, and protests against police brutality, this moment when there's so much um, emotional tumult, if you will, and uh, talk to Keith Ellison, talk to Martin Luther King III and others. And I asked them this question, which I'd like to ask you, which is, what do you think social justice looks and feels like? Because you've got people out protesting for that, but what is it? What do we need to do to give people, uh, whether they are lesbian and gay, transgender, bisexual, whether they are communities of color, whether they're all the other vulnerable communities that have been victims, what, what, what do we need to achieve that kind of feels and looks and walks like social justice? What's the North Star for you? So to me, it means equality and that everyone is treated equally under the law. But we have institutional problems. We have institutional racism. We have uh, institutional sexism. We have homophobia. Uh, we have laws that um, continue to discriminate against different groups of people. And so you have to attack each place that it's found in a way. So for example, if you're looking at institutional racism, you have to tackle it in the healthcare system. The fact mm. that if you are a black woman in America today, you are four times more likely to die in childbirth because of institutional racism in our healthcare system. You have to fix that. You have to go after racism in our education system, in our economy, in job training. Uh, you have to look at issues like reparations and study them and actually say, is there some s substantive changes we need to make to give a black American family the same chances as a white American family? We know because we've studied it and we've seen it that it's just not there. The wealth gap between black and white America is so severe. You're going to need real structural changes. Cory Booker loves the idea of baby bonds. Um, these are all good ideas. I want to do postal banking so more black families and mm. families of color can get access to capital. It's low interest, no interest loans, checking and saving accounts, simple things that aren't there and prohibit and, and make it hard for different communities to get ahead and make ends meet and have that opportunity for the American dream. Uh, we have the same type of institutional discrimination for LGBT uh, families, whether it's in housing, whether it's in jobs, whether it's in uh, the ability to have a child, have insurance cover, 
um, the type of procedures you need. All this is relevant for any person's ability to have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And so you have to level the playing field and do the hard work it takes to knock down these barriers in every place that exists. Senator, you ran for president or ran to become the Democratic nominee for president. So obviously you feel that 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 party uh, in part needs something that you can contribute to. What do you think the blind spots are, if you will, um, the responsibility, if you will, for your party for this moment we're in now? Because I, I think we need I mean, Ibram Kendi, of, of, uh, who wrote how to be an anti-racist and you know every one of us walks around with baggage we all have to be introspective parties do too so i'm interested in what you think your party needs to evolve on that it hasn't yet well i think the party has to commit to implementing these kinds of reforms and understand that it is going to be a long-term um, commitment that takes real work um, dealing with each kind of racism uh, that exists in society is going to take a long time. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can't start on it today. You can do these simple things like fixing our healthcare system so black women are believed when they say, I don't feel good, I don't feel right. You have to give much more training. You've got to fix the police. I mean, the fact that we couldn't get uh, Mitch McConnell to allow us to debate criminal justice reform, uh, the fact that we can't require body cameras and ban chokeholds because again, disproportionately harming black men, you have to fix it. Access to capital, disproportionately harming communities of color, businesses of color, uh, black owned businesses, women owned businesses. If you don't reshift your SBA and every other lending program in America to recognize that black owned businesses will be successful if they get access to capital, they, they they need a level playing field on so many areas. And so the party just has to understand you can't be shy. You got to move forward. You got to keep pushing as hard as, as we can and not be afraid of bold, bold reform. And one of the reasons why I ran for president is I wanted to talk about those bold ideas. You know, how about a jobs guarantee where everyone can actually get job training, no matter who they are, if they're underemployed or unemployed, and guarantee it through our community college and state school system or debt-free college and say, if you're willing to do public service for two years, you can get debt-free college or debt-free community college. Those are big ideas that can go at the heart of institutional racism and discrimination in our society, but they're new and they're big. And so not be afraid of taking on these tough fights. Um, I love your talk about bold ideas and big ideas, because if you're in Washington, there you're either an incrementalist or you're someone who believes in strategic leaps? And I know uh, that you're a strategic leap person. And, and I'd just love you to spend just in our last minute or so any other of these strategic leaps in the social justice area. And, and one I'm interested in because, uh, you know, Angela Davis uh, in, a, in an interview with me the other day said, you know, racism is sewn into the fabric of America and we need to do things. And, I, and it just made me think about, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates and, and the reparations debate. Do we need to do something that's not incremental and say, oh, folks, go study more, or we need a kind of new affirmative action program or something like that. Do we need to do something bigger than we're doing to give people who've been left out, uh, uh, as many others have gained? Are, is that one of the bold ideas that you, you could endorse? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, we had a quite a robust debate on the presidential campaign trail about the dozen best ideas to attack and address institutional racism. And one of them is this study of reparations to say, if you're going to give an opportunity to every black family in America um, because of the decades and, and frankly, hundreds of years of racism that has held back whole communities, how do you do it? And so Corey's idea was give every child a certain amount of money when they're born so they can actually accrue wealth over time. But that's not nearly enough. If you just literally wrote a check to every black family in America, you're not going to solve the problem because if that mom goes into a hospital room and dies giving birth because the doctor doesn't listen to her, you've not solved her problem. And so the truth is you have to go after each of these issues where you find them so that education is available, that healthcare is available, that job training and job opportunity and access to capital is available. It's got to be holistic. And so, yes, baby bonds can, can work, uh, but maybe a jobs guarantee is the answer. That's something MLK Jr. and Coretta Scott King fought for. Uh, it was what I Have a Dream speech was ultimately about. It was about how do you 
give economic opportunity to everyone. And I think if you create a guarantee that no matter who you are, if you're unemployed or underemployed, you can get training in industries that are growing. And now that we have over 40 million people unemployed, why not start it now and train people in healthcare, in education, in first responders, public service careers, uh, where you can constantly be investing and will always be needed. We've seen something during COVID that's quite stark. We've seen how black and brown people have been disproportionately harmed by this epidemic. And so we've also seen that they're also bearing uh, the brunt of this epidemic because they are the critical workers. Uh, people who work in grocery stores, at pharmacies, in hospitals, they tend to be black and brown people. Uh, they tend to be women, they tend to be lower paid, they tend to be marginalized. So why not make the commitment now to say, yeah, and we're gonna tr not only reward work, reward these critical workers with more resources, more money, universal sick days, national paid leave, more training so they can earn more money and get a higher paying job. That's what we should be talking about because that's how we change the country and how we begin to actually address legacy of racism. Well, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, I want to thank you for spending uh, time with us today and sharing your insights and the, and the many, uh, uh, I call them needles you've moved, but causes you've embraced. I, I just want to say one thing before I move to our last guest, Adam Rippon, that I remember the don't ask, don't tell debate, and it was a ferocious one. I remember having friends in the military who wanted to go and attend a human rights campaign dinner where President Obama was speaking, but this was before don't ask, don't tell repeal. And I said, you should go do what you want, but there are reporters out there, if you can call them that, that want to out you and that want to begin a legal process against you inside the military. And so we took their uniforms off, we took their names off and took a picture and said, what a tragedy that these people can't uh, salute their commander in chief in public. And that's what you helped change. So thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Good to see you, Kirsten. Thank you very much.